Well, welcome to the Longmont Museum on the internet. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum Stewart Auditorium, and we are not coming at you live from the Stewart Auditorium this evening. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, we've decided to take everything completely virtual and remote due to a uh, recent uptick in COVID cases here in Boulder County. Uh, tonight is being offered as part of our Thursday Nights at the Museum series. In fact, it is the last Thursday night program we'll be offering here in 2020. But don't be, don't, never you mind, don't fear, we'll be back in January with more Thursday night programming. And we'll be releasing our uh, full winter spring uh, program uh shortly so be on the lookout for that and if you haven't signed up for our email blast you can do so on our website i want to thank all the people who make these programs possible our museum members our museum donors the friends of the longmont Mu museum and the scientific and cultural facilities district otherwise known as uh, scfd I also want to thank our media sponsor, the mighty KGNU Community Radio out of uh, Deer Boulder, Colorado, just uh, a bit south of here. Um, tonight's program is a really exciting one. It's, uh, it's, it, it's really celebrating the moment we've all been waiting for here in Longmont and all of the various L towns around Boulder County. And I'm talking about the publication of Longmont, the first 150 years. It just hit our doorstep here at the museum or over there at the museum this week. And we've already sold, I think like a hundred copies of this. Tonight, we are here uh, for a conversation with the book's author, Eric Mason, the museum's curator of history. A little bit about um, Eric, and I'm going to read directly from the book flap. And uh, before I do, I should let you know that this book is available for purchase. Uh, whether you're looking for a, a stocking stuffer, it would have to be a very large stocking because it's a large, beautiful book, or a Christmas present for your family or whatever. I'd say it's a good one and it's gorgeous. It's available via our website, www.longmontmuseum.org. And we are offering curbside pickup. That's right. Anyway, without further ado, let me introduce Eric Mason. He is a native of Boulder, Colorado, who has been fascinated with history since his parents hung a poster of the U.S. presidents over his crib. He received a B.A. from Colorado College in Colorado Springs and an M.A. in History Museum Studies from the Cooperstown Graduate Program of the State University of New York. He has worked at the Longmont Museum for more than 20 years, which is unbelievable because I think he's like 27. And he's currently curator of history, as I mentioned, responsible for preserving the museum's historic object and archival collections, which are large, I might, say, might add. Among the exhibitions he has helped to develop are the museum's core installation, Front Range Rising, and special exhibits such as John Empson, Longmont's Robber Baron, and World War I, Longmont and the Great War. He lives in a 1923 bungalow in downtown Longmont with his two cats, which we may be lucky to catch a glimpse of this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eric Mason to the internet. Hi, Justin. Hi, Eric. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Strange not to be on the stage of the Stewart tonight, but we'll make do. Yeah, strange times. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, will your cats be joining us this evening? I know that they're... We will see. They, you know, they are cats. They do what they wish. Uh. <laughs> well, I just want to say congratulations on a gorgeous book. You must be just thrilled with the, with I the am. outcome. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, it's, it's so great to see it finally in hand um, after all the, all the work that's gone into it. I am delighted to finally be able to have it out there and have people be able to enjoy it. So how exactly does a guy from Boulder get to be the dude who writes the book on Longmont? How, how, how exactly does that happen? Well, in some ways, this book has been 25 years in the making. You know, I've, or 150 years in the making. Well, 150 years, true, true, true. 
Uh, I've been with the museum since 1996, so getting close to 25 years now. And um, all throughout that time, you know, anytime anyone came in with a research question, uh, you know, all of those little tidbits started to add up. And um, as uh, really it became clear that there had not been in quite a while a good comprehensive history of of Longmont written, it, it seemed like uh, it was really time for that to happen. Um, and as we developed more and more of our uh, museum's collection and uh, I started to understand that collection better, uh, realized there are just so many resources within the museum's collection that could be tapped to help write this book that um, it, it seemed a natural fit. So when did you, at what point did you realize that it really kind of dawned on you that this would, that you'd be the guy to do this? So, I mean, it's, it, it's been interesting. There's been a couple of folks that have written or attempted to write uh, books. There's been a few pictorial histories written over the years. And, and uh, you know, I've usually worked with, with those folks and I've always kind of said, oh, you know, the pictorial histories are nice, but gosh, you really need somebody to do the, the more uh, detailed, not just the pictures, but but the actual history behind it. And um, I started to realize, well, there's really probably that's that's going to be the museum, and and most likely I'm I'm the best person positioned to do that. So um, it uh, just kept uh, kept kind of building up, and um, it really uh, um, started to. Uh, snowball a couple of years ago. I uh, have to give a shout out to uh, Kathy Heineken with Barbed Wire Books. Mm. Um, she actually was the one to uh, email my boss and say, you know, the museum needs to do a, a history book. It, it, it's needed in this community and, and you're the ones to do it. And, and uh, you know, that was kind of the, uh, the trigger that, that started us off. And they're going to be selling selling the heck out of this book as we are. I, I hope uh, we'll have it uh, all around town and, and uh, up and down the front range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what sort of challenges did you kind of face in writing the book? Um, was there, were there, was it, yeah, basically what were the challenges, if any? So I, I was really fortunate to be able to take um, a sabbatical, uh, essentially, in, in February of 2019 to just spend dedicated time outlining the book. And so it wasn't really so much the overall arch of Longmont history. I was you know, pretty familiar with that. Um, it was kind of the, the internal structure, getting, getting, figuring out when you have history, you know, weaving in and out, these threads that uh, come and go throughout time, how you uh, decide when they are separate and you need to just tell one story and tell it to completion, and when the story needs to weave through many chapters. Um, so that was, that was one of my first challenges and, and uh, had some help from, uh, from our readers. I'll particularly thank uh, Heather Thorwald, a former museum staff member who was an early reader of the book and really gave me some great pointers on how to make sure that, that uh, it wasn't getting too choppy, but also was um, was a uh, entertaining read and the stories were carrying through well. Um, so that was probably one of the first challenges that that I faced. And you know, early on I knew it was going to be a lot of fun just because you know you're digging into this thing. It's a new project. Um, you've got lots of ideas. I kind of thought, uh, you know, I wonder if it's ever going to turn into a slog and and, uh, you know, am I just going to be like, oh, I've got to write more book today. But um, that never happened. I just, wow. you know, every, every time I uh, got an opportunity to, to work some more on the book, it was, it was fun. Um, I found new things. I, you know, uh, there were, there was a lot of the little details to, uh, to sort through and, um, one of the great times that I was able to do that was those early months of, of COVID, which was really when I was wrapping up the book and was all the little details of getting the footnotes right and getting the um, index and all those kind of things done. And um, 
to be able to do that in kind of an uninterrupted space, um, I think, you know, it was a, a terrible thing to have to have happened. But for me, it turned out to be a really great opportunity to, to polish the book that I probably wouldn't have had in that kind of dedicated time uh, without that shutdown. I think it was, I think COVID's been good for a lot of creative people in that way. Yeah, it really, I mean, it, it just, because it's such a complete um, break with the past, it's kind of an opportunity to just say, okay, we need to rethink everything we're doing or we need to just focus on the most important things. And that's, you know, what I've been able to do. Wow, yeah. Um, so no dark nights of the soul where you're tearing your hair out and you're like, my God, I am not even close. There's no way I can pause. I think this is my, this is my anxiety. If I had to write that book, I would have been up at, you know, 4.30 in the morning and at Kinko's or something, just like losing my mind. Yeah, I have to say, I'm glad I'm writing it now in the digital word processor era. Um, the idea of typing this out and, you know, oh my God, the footnote went onto the next page. Oh, I've got to redo 400 pages, you know. Um, I, I can't imagine that. That's, that's the beauty of, of modern uh, modern technology where you're like, oh, this needs to go in a different place. You know, drag it and drop it and there it is. And everything magically uh, reformats and, and there it is. So who, who did the, was there someone, did you work with a designer on the book? So the book is published by uh, Donning Publishers. They specialize in hardback, um, picture-rich um, uh, histories. And uh, they also published the Longmont album, which the museum did about 25 years ago. And so they were the ones that did uh, the final design, the final editing, um, the printing, uh, sent them out to, to the museum and all that. So uh, give them huge props. They, they were great to work with. And um, uh, particularly the designer, Stephanie Danko, just, you know, it was really fun to be able to work with a designer and and, uh, you know, see kind of what had looked like a manuscript with a bunch of pictures along the side suddenly turning into, wow, this is like a real book now. And you get that first proof where it's like, oh, wow, you know, yeah, it's got captions and it's got, you know, uh, text that's flowing correctly and all these things. That was, that was cool. That's when it really started to feel real for me when I saw that first uh, proof a few months back. Well, the, the result is gorgeous. And uh, I, I hear that it's currently ranked number one on the Longmont bestseller list. Is that hardback bestseller list? I think certainly for the past week or so, it's it's been probably outselling of every other, uh, you know, Longmont history book, definitely. You're, want, you're gonna wanna get your hands, ladies and gentlemen, on the, on the hottest book in Longmont right now. I, I was wondering what the, uh, any, any sort of big takeaways for you or, or surprises in writing this book? Now, I think one of the things that I really started to discover as I began to lay out the book, began to think about, okay, what are the big stories that, that run through it, is that there are some, some patterns through Longmont history. And one of them that I had kind of known, but really hadn't, um, quite understood how much this repeated throughout history was the recurrence of floods in Longmont history. I mean, obviously, most of us lived through the flood of 2013, experienced that. Uh, for me, that was the first flood I'd experienced in, in Colorado. Um, and as it turns out, that was just sort of a historical quirk. The uh, next flood before uh, um, that one happened just a couple years before I was born in 1969. Longmont just happened to escape that one because they just completed Button Rock Dam mm -hmm. and it held back basically uh, what would have been a very significant flood um, and filled, filled a dam in, in three weeks, which they expected would take multiple years to fill. Um, then before that, there were floods in 1935, 1921, 1894, 1864. So, you know, it's it's easy to forget because we see the St. Brain River and think this is a, just a stream. It's hardly uh, anything. And, um, you know, Longmont is in a floodplain and and that's, that's something that history has borne out. Um, and then another 
interesting thing that again I had kind of known about but really this uh, developing this book brought home to me how much particularly over the last 75 or so years Longmont has shifted in such a big way from being a small town that had to really struggle to get significant amenities constructed. So for example, uh, the St. Brain Memorial Building, the first modern uh, recreation facility in Longmont, um, that was a major fundraising effort over multiple years by the community and um, just a huge process to get that funded. And you compare that to the Longmont Rec Center, uh, which was a bond issue um, in uh, 1999, it was approved by voters, but uh, there wasn't need to do, uh, you know, bake sales and so forth to uh, build the slide for the Longmont Rec Center. And the same thing with uh, Longmont United Hospital, uh, when the, what was then the new hospital out on Mountain View was built, um, they actually put themselves over the top in their fundraising efforts by auctioning off a fur coat. I was like, <laughs> the final item to get enough money to actually start it. And there was a lot of federal dollars involved as well. Um, and then, you know, over the years since then, you know, now um, it uh, it adds new buildings and, and it certainly doesn't require that, that level of fundraising uh, any longer. Do you attribute that to just sheer population expansion? Or? I mean, I think it's population. It's to some extent, you know, on a sort of, macroeconomic level, the maturing of things like municipal bond markets and so forth. But but a lot of it is, yeah, you know, a town of 10,000 has very different level of resources than a town of 100,000 does. And yeah. um, so, you know, we see the things that um, that don't even really cross our minds as it would, would be a challenge today, would have been a huge challenge uh, 60 years ago. So that was kind of a surprise that was something you learned in the process of writing this book that kind of stood out? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and just the whole point of, you know, when, when Longmont as a city government began, you know, they had two staff, um, and um, basically what they did is they wet down the dust on the streets, and they had one, um, you know, night watchman to uh, maintain order, and uh, of course, today we have you know uh, something like eight or nine hundred city employees and uh, provide dozens of different services to the community. Um, so all of that is is something that has grown over the course of the last one hundred and fifty years. And I think one of the big take takeaways is is kind of the resilience of of Longmont, right? To overcoming yeah. natural disasters and. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan and uh, so, some civil unrest and, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I wanted to make sure that this book was not a, everything's always been great in Longmont um, because um, the reality is we've had some hard times and you mentioned the Ku Klux Klan, you know, that, that was a really dark time in, in Longmont and in Colorado history. I mean, I think it's important to recognize that, that Longmont was not, the center of Ku Klux Klan activity in, in Colorado, although it certainly was, uh, you know, Longmont seems to have been a, uh, a power in the, in the Klan forces in that time. So, um, and the Klan was around for quite a long time, although they only held power for about uh, four years in Longmont. Um, but yeah, I think that that idea that uh, Longmont has had some really significant um, times. In fact, this was another real surprise to me, probably the thing that I'd never thought about that much until I started doing research. Probably the closest Longmont ever came to really ceasing to exist um, was very early on in 1873. Um, it was just two years old. Uh, the town had actually just gotten itself uh, incorporated, uh, changed over from its founding organization, the Chicago Colorado Colony, just the beginning of 1873. And in April of 1873, the railroad, the Colorado Central Railroad, 
arrived from coming up from Golden and that linked Col uh, Longmont to markets, you know, all across the country and of course linked as well um, to resources, being able to bring in lumber and, and furniture and so forth on the train. Um, just a few months after that, a major economic uh, panic hit, the Panic of 1873, and that lasted about four years um, before they were able to continue constructing the railroad. So if they hadn't made it to Longmont, Longmont was where the railroad stopped for four years. If they hadn't made it to Longmont, I think it's anybody's guess whether the town would have survived. You know, it was a, it was a rough economic time. Uh, certainly other communities didn't make it, but uh, because it had that railroad link, um, it was able to uh, uh, get its goods out and um, I was able to survive and then once once the railroad continued to build and linked up uh, with other railroads and they added additional lines uh, over the coming years really Longmont was became a, an important uh, agricultural hub uh, for a lot of different industries. And we should all remember that when we're stuck waiting for the train on Ken Pratt or Main Street. Yep the railroad follows exactly the same path as it did in 1873 so uh, when you're it, shaking your fist at that train remember that we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. okay. All right is, is there a section of the book that you're or a story that come from the book that is particularly th th that's your favorite? Was there a favorite <laughs> section or something? Oh you know it's kind of like asking you know what's your favorite child it's you know there's there's so or many or cat, yes, yeah. yes. Well, that's usually the cat that's, you know, um, not currently sick. So, you know, uh, um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think probably the, the colony era, the colony story, the idea that Longmont begins as this unusual gathering of idealists who decide rather than uh, using a traditional, you stake out a town, or you gold, you know, Russia town kind of thing. That that it was a really planned community. That they sent out people from Chicago to choose the site of the town. It wasn't just here's a good spot. We're going to found a town here. They were very deliberate about all of that. Um, and because it's also quite well documented, particularly we have um, several different sets of letters. We have uh, the letters of of uh, one of the early colony presidents, Seth Terry, for whom Terry Street is named, as well as correspondence um, uh, with uh, George Bowen, for whom Bowen Street was named. He never ended up moving to Longmont, but was a significant power in Chicago and in the colony back there. Um, so, so we have this great documentation and it gives us some personalities. And, and uh, one of the things that I was not able to include as much as I would have liked was the story of a, of a man named William Holly, who was an early um, uh, figure within the colony movement, but who clearly felt he was far more important than much of anybody else in the colony seems to have thought of him as. He's constantly writing his, his patron was George Bowen, and he would write back to George Bowen about, oh yes, you know, I've, I've, I've purchased this tent and it's going to be called Bowen Hall and it will be the, you know, forever remembered uh, uh, hall within uh, Longmont history. And as far as I know, I, I think I actually mentioned it in my book, but I think I'm the first Longmont history book that mentions Bowen Hall. It's just, you know, it, it really did not. His, well, much of what he thought and much of what he felt like he was doing um, uh, did not end up being that significant to Longmont history. And and uh, sadly enough, and we don't really know why, but ultimately the, the uh, colonists on the ground here actually petitioned to have him removed. He was acting as their agent in Denver and they uh, got, got so fed up with him that they, they petitioned to have him removed from, uh, from uh, being an officer within the colony. So, um, you know, there's these interesting stories and another fascinating uh, person that, um, I really would love to do more on is Elizabeth Thompson. Uh, Thompson Park is named for her and she was a philanthropist out of uh, both Vermont and New York City, split her time between them and um, was extremely involved in a lot of progressive 
uh, causes. And I've actually found out uh, since um, really completing the book that uh, she actually corresponded with Frederick Douglass. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the papers of Frederick Douglass are actually going to feature some, a couple of her letters with uh, with um, uh, between Elizabeth Thompson and Frederick Douglass. So um, fascinating woman. She, again, did not uh, live in Longmont, but she did visit here um, in 1871, and she uh, not only supported the colony uh, by providing money for uh, memberships for people that could not afford it. Uh, uh, membership in the colony was $155, which was a couple of months salary for a skilled tradesperson at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, a significant amount of money. Um, but she funded a number of people that she felt like needed a new start in the West. Um, so, you know, all of these interesting characters in the, in the colony story. And, and uh, you know, I think there's, there's probably another book in that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that whole story. Um, so. so you think we, there, you, we, so we haven't seen the last of, of you? in terms of your authorship? We will see, we will see. But, uh, you know, I am I certainly would be, be up for writing another book if uh, things work out. I think we may need one after this. <laughs> um, let's talk about the photos, shall we? I mean, how did you, uh, how did you, how did you uh, decide on the cover photo? All right, well, let me go ahead and uh, I will share some photos here. Fantastic. All right, so uh, this is the uh, the cover photo, um, and this one is uh, by a local photographer of contemporary photographs. This is by uh, C. Nathan Pulley, and he was um, very involved in a campaign called You Belong in Longmont a few years ago, and uh, took a lot of photographs around Longmont. And what struck me about this one, it's interesting, Longmont is named for Long's Peak, but it's actually kind of hard to get a good photo of Long's Peak that really shows Longmont. Um, it's actually one of the things I think the, the colony founders missed an opportunity. If you're in Colorado Springs, you know that Pikes Peak points, Pikes Peak Avenue points straight at Pikes Peak. And in Longmont, Long's Peak Avenue does not. Um, so I think they missed an opportunity there. But um, but this was a, a great photo, I thought, that did show Long's Peak as the history of the sugar factory. Um, so it really illustrates a lot of different eras in Longmont history. Were there any other photos that were kind of vying for the cover or was this like, this is it? Um, you know, one of the things we definitely wanted with the cover photo was a color photo. Um, and so I did look at some historic color photos, but Ultimately, I thought it was really important to show that this is a book that does bring us up to the present day. It doesn't just stop, you know, in 1920 or something. So I like this more contemporary looking photo. And the old sugar mill is totally appropriate to have yeah. in the yeah. shot. Yeah. yeah. So let's take a look at another uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, photos from the book. Um, and this is actually an illustration. Um, the first real view we have of Longmont uh, was done in 1873 um, by a fairly well-known uh, artist that was traveling around Colorado named A.E. Matthews. He did a number of these sketches of communities up and down the Front Range. And um, yeah, he takes a fairly fanciful look at, at Long's Peak, which is kind of visible in the background here. Uh, towers a little higher than it really does in, in the foothills, but, um, uh, you know, you can see just how small Longmont is at this point. It's really a scattering of houses, and um, he's also put in here a train coming in. It's actually not really where the train was, but I think he knew it was important for Longmont to know, to note that the train was coming at that point. Um, so uh, this is, um, just, I think, a fascinating photo, a fascinating illustration of, you know, one of the earliest views we have of, of Longmont at that time. And then um, this one is um, taken in the early 1880s, and I think 
this is an example of really the resiliency of Longmont. So uh, this is the 300 block of Main Street. Um, to kind of orient you, this is the Dickens Opera House, which is at 300 Main. Um, and um, we have this whole series of brick buildings all along this side of the street, um, on the left side. And all of these are basically new within just the last couple of years because this was the portion of Longmont that burned in a fire in 1879. Um, and it was um, kind of a catalyst to realizing that if this was going to be a community that was going to last, they needed to think about building uh, their uh, buildings out of more durable materials. The first buildings in the early colony were all out of wood, and so they uh, um, were destroyed in that fire in 1879 on the, the left side of the street. And then on the right side, um, the, they survived the fire, but uh, city council passed an ordinance that said all future construction should be out of brick. And so we see, even by the 1880s, most of the wooden buildings on, on both sides of Maine in the 300 block have been replaced with brick. Um, but I also love this photo just because it's just has so many interesting little details in it. So, you know, you have this uh, boot that's uh, out on a pole. It's almost certainly a, uh, a, you know, sign. Not everyone at that time probably could read and could read a sign that says, oh, you know, that's a shoe shop. But they could see that, no, that's a boot. Okay, that's probably where I can go and get my shoes. Um, and then this uh, blur here, which, you know, shows you the the long exposures they needed to do is almost certainly a dog and uh, doing what dogs usually do to fire hydrants. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's uh, just just a fascinating photo capturing capturing that moment in Longmont history. And some of the buildings that were there on Main Street were actually relocated, right, and are still standing. Is that true? Yes, yes. Uh, at least one of the ones on the uh, uh, west side of Main Street, the old uh, Emerson and Buckingham Bank. Uh, was actually moved onto Third Avenue and is today a house. And you would never guess today that it hadn't been a house all of its life. And it was built, when it was originally built, it did look fairly uh, domestic. I think the, the builder probably knew more about house construction than commercial uh, architecture. But um, uh, they had to build it quickly because um, the safe for the uh, bank was delivered before the building was ready. So actually for a while, they just parked the safe in the middle of the street because it had taken a six mule team to, to bring it over from Greeley. And I guess they decided the odds of another six mule team stopping by um, with the ability to move the safe was pretty small. So um, they did banking out of the middle of the street in Longmont for a little while until <laughs> the bank building was ready. And, and uh, uh, within, you know, uh, by the 1880s, they had a beautiful stone bank building that had replaced that first uh, wooden building. And so they, they moved that building. And that was not un atypical to move buildings at that time, particularly in the era before uh, overhead uh, power and, and uh, uh, communication lines made moving buildings a uh, considerably bigger challenge than it had been before that. Do you know how I knew about that move? I do not because I went on one of your historic walking tours and learned it. So ah, very you? good. Yes, yes, indeed. We do go by the, the old Emerson and Buckingham Bank uh, on our Third Avenue walking tour. If you haven't been on one of, one of those, you need to sign up the next time we have them. Yes, we will have them again in uh, uh, the spring. and. Hopefully by then, maybe we'll be able to be a little bit more open in the number of folks we can have. We've been pretty limited uh, given the, the current restrictions, but uh, I know they are always popular. We'll go ahead and head to our next photo, which is, I think, uh, a real classic. Um, one of Longmont's big events in the late 1890s and early 1900s was Pumpkin Pie Day. In addition to pumpkin pie, they served coffee. And uh, you get a sense, they had some pretty serious coffee. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, um, a pretty well-known author, Damon Runyon, was a reporter with the Rocky Mountain News and came up to cover 
uh, pumpkin pie day and he talks about yeah they served coffee from a urn the size of a railroad uh, water tank and I think this was the exact urn he was talking about um, but they estimated maybe as many as 10,000 people might have have come to Longmont for pumpkin pie day um, and I also want to give a, a shout out on this photo to uh, one of our museum volunteers Catherine Scott uh, the original of this photo uh, has been damaged and is actually in several pieces and so it was was really kind of hard to, to see quite uh, uh, the image and uh, she was able you know with the miracle of Photoshop to knit everything together and make mm -hmm. it into one seamless composition so you really get this impact of, of this gigantic uh, coffee urn and the, the size of the dippers too it's like man I, I assume those were not uh, cups of coffee that they were uh, serving out of those dippers because you know that you'd be wired for a week or so if you drank that much coffee. I think we need to bring that back, the, the coffee urn and pumpkin pie day, because I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the urn would be a, a great addition to the St. Vrain Historical Society's uh, pumpkin pie day. They, uh, uh, their coffee, I think, pots are a little bit smaller these days. So um, Next photo really gets into one of the real significant turning points in Longmont history and one that brought a wide variety of people from all around the world to Longmont and that was um, the arrival of the sugar beet industry. Uh, 1903, uh, the uh, Longmont Sugar Factory was built. A couple years later, it became part of Great Western Sugar. Um, and it meant that farmers were growing sugar beets all throughout this area to uh, serve the factory. And um, this is a young woman named Emma Suazo. I actually had the uh, pleasure of meeting uh, Emma Suazo before she passed away some years ago. Um, she and her family had come up from New Mexico. Um, uh, they heard there was opportunity in Longmont working in the beet fields. And you can see that she is holding a short-handled hoe. This was a, a um, tool that eventually was banned because it was considered so abusive because it required you to work on hands and knees. You couldn't uh, um, stand up to work in the beet fields if you were using one of those short-handled hoes. Um, but uh, beets were a very labor-intensive crop and so they drew people from really all around the world to come to Longmont. We had um, Latinx people coming from Texas and New Mexico and, and Mexico itself. Uh, we had uh, German Russians, uh, people who were ethnically German but had been living in Russia coming to this area. We had Scandinavian uh, groups. Uh, we had uh, Japanese Americans uh, uh, all coming into this area drawn by the, the need for uh, work in the agricultural fields. And um, so, you know, it, it's really an important part of our story and, and an important source of the diversity that we see in Longmont today. Another of my favorite photos, um, both just because I think it, it tells a great story and because how we acquired it is a, a wonderful story. Um, so the um, in 1937, this woman, Genevieve Johnson, um, was very upset at her uh, ex-husband, Ralph. He was not um, paying his alimony. And uh, there wasn't a lot of recourse. She didn't have any children. So there wasn't at that time uh, a lot of opportunity in the courts to enforce uh, an alimony settlement. And um, so she decided to gain attention, she would do a sit down strike. And so she got a rocking chair and she sat in front of the house where he was living. Um, and for some reason, I think because it was the depression and people were just looking for any kind of distraction, this became national news. There were newsreels about it. And in this photo we see, you know, People were bringing her all kinds of things, blankets and food and all this. And, and in this photo, we have the Longmont Elks Cowboy Band serenading her as she sits um, in front of her ex-husband's house in 1937. And, 
And we found out about this story actually because we have a button. There was a company out of St. Louis that made buttons in honor of her sit down strike for alimony. And we have one of those in the collection. And so we're like, what, what in the story? Sit down strike for alimony. So dug into the um, story a little bit more and I really wanted to use it in the book, but I didn't have a good photo of her. I, I was planning on using just a, a scan from a, a newspaper and it was not the best quality. And, and literally the book was in proof stages when um, a lovely couple, uh, Kathy and Irv Rell, uh, came to the museum with a collection from their friend, uh, their late friend, Peggy Carroll. And Peggy Carroll had uh, lived in Longmont uh, as a young woman, as had her parents, and, and her father is actually in the Elks uh, Cowboy Band picture. And as we're going through the pictures of um, that um, we, uh, uh, that they were proposing to donate, I came across this one and I gasped audibly because it was, this is the sit down striker. This is the photo I have needed to, you know, really tell this story. And I was just so delighted to be able to slip it in under the wire, you know, uh, send it to the designer as she was finalizing the book. And so um, I just, I love the, the photo. I think it's a fun photo. You can tell she's just soaking in the attention and um, it just tells such a wonderful story of, of Longmont history. Did she ever get the alimony? I think the that's what we need to know. sad thing, and this is, you know, something maybe somebody out there watching knows the rest of the story, because in the newspaper, um, ultimately, after 17 days, um, they were getting thousands of people driving by, uh, wishing her well, or hurling abuse, unfortunately, both of those things are, are nothing new. After 17 days, they finally called a halt. The uh, the chief of police actually arrested her for causing a public nuisance. Um, but he also um, charged her husband with uh, non-payment. Um, the two sides we see in the paper are suing and countersuing. And the story just kind of fades out of the headlines. And sadly, I was never able to track down what happened. Um, both she and her ex-husband leave Longmont not too long after this, from what I can tell. And, mm. So I never really find out what, what the story is, but, but hopefully maybe somebody will, will know the rest of the story and can fill that in for, uh, for posterity. Stunning photo. So our, the next photo I'd like to highlight is one that um, I'd, I'd included in the book because I liked it. Um, it's an aerial photo from about 1950. But it wasn't really until, again, I was looking at the proofs where the designer had actually zoomed in kind of on this section. This is a detail from a larger photo that showed all of, all of Longmont. And I started to notice just some wonderful little details. And that's, again, we're having this, you know, uh, photo. And this one is really taking up a good portion of a page within the book. And so you see these, you know, cool little details, like there's a, um, boxcar parked on a railroad siding right here. And uh, there's these billboards, you can just see the back of them that face Third Avenue, a couple of different ones of them here. Um, and just lots of little details, another one right here, billboard, that's, uh, um, makes you realize, you know, Main Street was one of the major uh, highways, north-south highways running, running up to Wyoming at that time. And, and so uh, just, just a, a great capture of what Longmont looked like in about 1950. Still feels very much like a small town at that point. And uh, then another photo, and this one really illustrates uh, a collection that I think was also one of the real triggers for being able to write this book. So um, in 2015, uh, the museum uh, became the repository for the Longmont Times Calls photograph collection. Um, and the museum's collection is really strong in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then less so as we get into the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and then starts to pick up again in, you know, the 90s and, and 2000s. But um, there was a big gap in our collection, and as it happens, the Times Call collection 
neatly filled that gap. And so this is a really striking photo of, of one of the great uh, tragedies in Longmont history, the crash of the United Airlines uh, mainliner Denver airplane, which was at um, uh, Highway 66 and Weld County Road 11. So uh, somewhat east of Longmont. In fact, today it'd be a little bit east of I-25, but uh, the plane was actually brought down by a bomb. It was an insurance uh, scam. It had taken off from Stapleton Airport a few minutes earlier and uh, uh, crashed in a farm field uh, east of Longmont. And it was, you know, uh, Longmont people that uh, were rushing out there both to try and help and in some cases just out of curiosity they ultimately had to bring out the National Guard to kind of bring the scene under control and you can kind of see just you know we've got all kinds of people just sort of milling around the crash site in this um, and uh, this was a photograph that uh, uh, you know we, um, a few years ago a book was actually written specifically on this crash and at that time uh, we didn't have any photos of the crash in our collection. It wasn't really until the, the Times Call uh, collection that we were able to uh, actually feature a true photograph um, in, uh, in the book. So uh, really a great, great resource that we've been able to add. And um, then uh, this book also allowed us to include some color photos. There's a couple of sections of color photos within the book. And, and uh, this is a building that people who were in Longmont in the late 1980s, early Longmont, uh, early 90s, remember with either uh, fondness or um, despite, depending on your perspective, but this was called Cheaper Charlie's Shed. And uh, it was a very much loved and hated landmark at Ninth and Hover in Longmont. And uh, it was painted and repainted in these messages and then I think this this uh, photo really captures you know it was not so much graffiti as just you know messages to the community and all of these are are uh, really uh, positive messages that uh, uh, that the sign uh, that the building would show again and again and um, so when uh, um, we had the opportunity to do color this was one I thought oh yeah we've got to show cheaper Charlie's in in full color um, the building was torn down in 1990, um, and uh, you know it's a kind of a sad thing in some ways. It was really a, a community center in in some interesting ways. That actually the land was vacant until just a few years ago, but um, uh, definitely a, an important part of Longmont history. We d we we the museum managed to salvage a section of it and has it on display. So it's it's actually a, a recreation. Oh, yeah. isn't it a recreation? In our, uh, in our Front Range Rising exhibit, um, the, uh, the number of layers of paint and the amount of lead paint that was used in, in creating the original shed made, made a, uh, displaying an actual piece kind of a hazard. But um, uh, so we created a, a replica that, um, that uh, uh, in, in pre-COVID times, you could actually write your own message on that periodically we would clean off. And we'll, we'll have that again one of these years. Yep, uh, one of the classic Longmont landmarks. And um, this photo, which uh, I think is our, our final set of, of photos um, from the book, really illustrates how history does repeat itself. Um, so we have on the left, the 1894 flood uh, taken from First and Main. See the railroad tracks. Um, and the flood waters really washing across what was then basically a, an empty valley uh, south of Longmont proper. Longmont ended at First Avenue. And then by 2013, uh, essentially that same almost exact spot, uh, we have a photo taken, but by then, unfortunately, Longmont had, had spread throughout the floodplain. And so that's why we saw really so much more damage in 2013 than in the earlier floods, because Longmont had built across the floodplain, and that's why now you see so much work going on and will continue for a number of years to re-channel the river to hopefully prevent uh, the river from jumping out of its banks in future, future floods. So I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of a uh, few photos from the book. There's, there's almost 300 in the book, so a lot of other opportunities to uh, 
take a look at uh, photos from throughout Longmont history. Um, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing now and, and maybe if there are uh, any uh, photos on, or any uh, questions on Facebook or uh, anyone that, uh, uh, any other questions from you, Justin, I'm uh, happy to uh, answer them. Well, I want to encourage everyone out there in, in, in Facebook land to uh, ask us questions in the comments. Um, there are a few questions here. Let me, uh, let me just scroll through here. Uh, there's, um, Clara is wondering if there's a section in the book about uh, the muse museum's phenomenal effort uh, around Dia de los Muertos and our annual exhibitions. Is there any talk of, of Dia de los Muertos? Ah, uh, you know, I think one of, one of the hardest things, obviously, in writing a book like this is um, all of the things that uh, you're not able to fit in. And um, so, um, and I decided, you know, even though I'm writing uh, for the museum, it, it seemed a little unfair to really feature a lot about the museum itself. Um, and, and maybe again, there's a, another book about kind of the, the museum and some of the things that it's done over the years. So um, I, I mentioned it briefly in terms of some of the new, uh, the new building that, that went up, but um, wasn't able to get into uh, Dia de los Muertos particularly. Um, but uh, yeah, there's just just so many stories that uh, uh, you know could have filled another two or three books um, that wasn't able to include. I did notice that the uh, chapter on the auditorium and its manager was didn't make it either. Well, you know that in itself is is obviously a you know a multi-volume work. Certainly. That's yeah, that's that's what I think. Anyway, let's uh, lots of congratulations. Uh, Nancy says, congratulations, Eric. Looking forward to buying the book. Uh, she used to work at the front desk. This is Nancy Imbergia or Imbergia. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, good to hear from you, Nancy. She said, people were always asking for a book when they came by the front desk. You're filling the void. Uh, more congratulations from the St. Vrain Historical Society. Uh, people love the sit-down strike story. They look, they're looking forward to getting the book. They want to know if there are any autographed copies available. Oh, yes, yes. So that's, um, we do have autographed copies available at the museum. And we can also, if, if somebody wants, you know, a, a particular uh, dedication or something, I'm, I'm glad to do that. So we can arrange, arrange that as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully there will come a time when we're, not so uh, having to be socially distant where we could do an in-person book signing or something uh, since uh, next year is Longmont's 150th anniversary and that the celebration will go on all year. Hopefully there'll be a point where we can uh, really have a, a good book signing uh, on this book. Claire is asking a follow-up question about uh, in the inclusion of the Latinx community in, in, the, in the book. Yeah, it's very important, uh, you know, very key part of Longmont history and uh, part that I really wanted to make sure and, and feature a number of stories from. So uh, we talk about a uh, number of different uh, Latinx individuals um, within, uh, within Longmont, you know, Benjamin Rodriguez, the first uh, Longmont city council member, um, is a, a, an important story and just uh, individuals that um, uh, perhaps haven't gotten a lot of attention. Uh, we have um, a story of um, uh, Romolo Martinez and Romolo Martinez was um, uh, instrumental in getting the white trade only signs taken down uh, on Main Street. So uh, in the 20s, 30s, you know, some of that clan influence. And even up into the 40s and 50s, uh, there were a number of businesses on Main Street that um, uh, had white trade only signs. And uh, Romolo Martinez and, and the Spanish American club that he was a member of uh, approached those businesses and they said, you know, we are members of this community. This, these signs make us feel like dogs. And 
no, the signs came down. It took uh, efforts of the Spanish American Club. It took um, uh, veterans, uh, Latinx veterans coming back from uh, uh, World War II. Uh, there's a story of a, a man in uniform, Latinx man in uniform, who was not served and you know made quite a fuss. And the, the restaurant owner called the police. And the police arrived and said, this is a man in uniform. You serve him, or you shut down. Wow! And so you know, there there was there were people in that time that uh, were uh, you know taking taking uh, significant stands to uh, to fight racism, and um, and we do uh, talk as well about the uh, the tragedy on Main Street in 1980, where um, uh, Jeffrey Cordova and Juan Luis Garcia were uh, shot by a Longmont police officer and killed, and and how the community uh, reacted to that in a way that ultimately um, was able to build bridges that they, uh, they decided not to bring in outside agitators. They kept those out and really worked together as a community to build a lot of bridges between the Latinx community and the, the police at that time. And how El Comité came out of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, very important organization. Um, Sharon is wondering, um, do you have info on the book about Native American tribes who inhabited the area where Longmont currently is? Yes, so the first, uh, first chapter of the book um, really focuses on uh, the, uh, the earliest people and the people um, you know, whose land we all really sit on to this day, um, starting from uh, the many thousands of years ago, you know, not that long ago, we thought it was about 14,000 years. We now think it's, it's much longer than that, that uh, people have lived in this area. Um, and then coming up, and, and we, we talk quite a bit, particularly about uh, uh, Chief Left Hand, who was a Southern Arapaho um, native leader, um, who was probably the person that um, the earliest um, uh, people that were writing about uh, this area really had the most interaction with uh, Chief Left Hand or Niwot or Niwa, as it should be pronounced, um, mm -hmm. who um, uh, lived in this area and very, very far-sighted individual. He actually um, learned English. Uh, his uh, uh, brother-in-law was a... Um, a uh, trader, a man named John Poisel, and probably learned English from him as well as other fur traders living in this area in the 1830s, 1840s. And um, uh, uh, Left Hand actually, by some accounts, even traveled east, maybe as far as Iowa, just to get a sense of who were these people coming into this area. And, uh, you know, tried very hard to um, uh, create peace between uh, the native tribes and the gold seekers. And unfortunately, he most likely was uh, uh, severely injured at the Sand Creek Massacre and died shortly thereafter. Um, one of the darkest uh, incidents in Colorado history and unfortunately an incident that um, a number of people living in the Longmont area, Longmont had not been founded at that point, but the precursor community of Burlington um, there were about uh, 20 people from Burlington that, that participated in that uh, massacre. So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely some, some dark times in, in Longmont history, and I tried to make sure and, and illustrate those, but also, um, you know, illustrate that um, we, we have been a very resilient community, and, and we recognize those, those things and, and tried to uh, um, make amends in more recent years. Uh, Clara has another question. She's wondering if uh, you could expand upon the legend of uh, Chief Niwats or Niwa. Is that what you, is that how it's? Um, Niwa is, is the more correct uh, pronunciation as I understand it from, uh, from a native speaker. Yeah. Um, she was wondering if you could touch on uh, Chief Niwa's curse and its relationship to, to uh, Longmont. <laughs> so the, the, the story, and again, it, it's, hard to know whether this is this most likely is an apocryphal story it did not did not make it into the book but uh, um, 
uh, his curse is that uh, when you uh, have come to this area, um, you may leave, but you will always want to return. You will always return. That this is such a, a beautiful area that uh, uh, you can never truly uh, leave without a backward glance. It's, it's, um, and I think it is true that, that anyone who has lived here always, you know, they, they remain uh, with fond memories of this area. I am not from here, but I, 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 I left and came back. So I, I, and there are lots of people I know who, who went to college here or lived here for a bit and then took a long break and then realized that they, they had to get back here. I'm one of those folks. Um, I think that's about the end of our questions as far as I can tell. And I, and I think this is a great, a great uh, parting moment here. I think, you know, if, if you aren't in Longmont for some reason and you haven't returned yet, you can, you can always come back to Longmont via this book. So visit our website, longmontmuseum.org, and order one, and order one for everyone you know. I mean, if you live in Longmont and this is not on your coffee table within the next few months, I don't know. This, this belongs on everyone's coffee table, as far as I'm concerned. Everyone's coffee table in Longmont. Well, thanks, Justin. Eric, I'm really enjoying the book. I can't, I, I can't wait. I, I, this is going to be something that I can just turn to again and again and again. I just, it's, a, it's the book that keeps on giving. And I, you know, I think it's coming right at the right time for us, too. I mean, we're, we're about to step into 2021, which is going to be a much better year than 2020, not just because it's the sesquicentennial of Longmont, but because it won't be 2020 anymore, just for that reason itself. Um, we're going to be celebrating all year the 150th anniversary of Longmont's founding in 2021, right? And then there's an exhibition mm -hmm. coming Yes, yes. So we will, uh, in June, we'll open up an exhibition called Longmont 150 that uh, builds on a lot of what is in the book in terms of history, uh, but takes kind of a different approach. We're actually going to be kind of flipping history on its head and starting from the present day and looking at uh, some of the roots of things that we experience today um, and how those are, are rooted in Longmont's history. So we're very excited about that. That exhibit, it'll run uh, through the rest of, of 2021 from, from June onward. And uh, we are in the midst of planning that exhibit now. So uh, it's gonna be a great one. And, and uh, the first part of 2021, we have a fabulous exhibit that we are super excited about, um, the Impressionists, um, including uh, original works by uh, uh, Monet, uh, Pissarro, um, and just some extraordinary Impressionist works that, um, we are delighted to be sharing with the Longmont community. And we'll, be have, we'll have related programming throughout the winter and spring uh, in regards to tying into that Impressionism exhibition. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, we've, got a lot, we've got a lot to look forward to at the museum. Um, 2021 is gonna be, it's gonna be a big year for us, I think. Um, I wanna thank you again, Eric, for taking some time this evening for a chat and for showing us uh, a bit of your book. If you, if, if, if we've wedded, if we've just barely, you know, wedded your, your appetite here, um, I encourage you to, to pick one up and, and really, really dig in. Um, as I mentioned, this is the last Thursday night, uh, Thursday, last of our Thursdays um, for the year. Um, we do have one last program coming up on December 5th. It's our annual holiday show. And this year we're doing it as a, in, in, in classic telethon style. So we'll have some of your favorite uh, area bands performing. And in between, we'll be having little chats with folks. And uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a great holiday celebration and you'll have opportunities to, uh, to support the museum. And uh, at a certain level, I know that we'll be giving away the book uh, with a, a, certain, uh, with a certain level of gift um, in support of the museum. Anyway, I hope to see you all on December 5th. Um, in the meantime, have a terrific Thanksgiving and Eric and I will see you at the museum or hope to see you at the museum soon. 
Thank you all.